Good morning and welcome. I'm Michael Kessler, Executive Director of the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace and World Affairs at Georgetown University and a faculty member in government and theology. I'm delighted to welcome you to today's conversation, searching for Omar Ibn Said with our very special guests, Jennifer Barry Howes and Gavin McIntyre. I would like to thank our co-hosts and partners in this and other events Ann Peters and Holly Rosewood at the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting. Today's session will be moderated by my colleague, Paul Eli. Paul is a senior fellow with the Berkeley Center and directs our American Pilgrimage Project, a university partnership with StoryCorps. Paul's work deals primarily with the ways religious ideas are given expression in literature, the arts, music, and culture. Paul is a prominent essayist among his, among the many venues are The New Yorker and The Atlantic. And among his most important works are two very splendid books, The Life You Save May Be Your Own and American Pilgrimage and Reinventing Bach. Paul, delighted to have you moderate today's session and you'll be introducing the panelists. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. Thanks to all who have joined us. And uh, all of us at the Berkeley Center have anticipated this event with the Pulitzer Center for some weeks now. And so I'm glad finally to have us all convene together on screen. Quick reminder to those who are tuned in as audience, there's a chance for a Q&A towards the end of the event. And uh, if you post your questions uh, in the Q&A session of Zoom, we'll be going through the questions and can direct those to the participants as appropriate. And now to the participants. I'm pleased to introduce the uh, uh, um, pair who are responsible for searching for uh, Ibn Said, Jennifer Barry House. She's a reporter on the Post and Courier in Charleston, South Carolina. She's on the Watchdog and Public Service team. She's a member of the winning uh, team for the 216, 2016 Pulitzer Prize in Public Service and the finalist for the 2019 Pulitzer Prize in Feature Writing and her current work focuses on investigative narratives. Gavin McIntyre, currently a staff photographer for the Post and Courier. He's also worked for Al Jazeera, the America's Fault Lines, the Bay City Times, the Sacramento Bee, and the State. And his work covers topics from the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant explosion to South Carolina's black cowboys. Jennifer and Gavin, uh, very glad to uh, be with you and to hear about this um, singular project. So. Uh, just to begin, where in effect you two ended, uh, uh, who is Omar Ibn Said? Um, well, I just want to start off by saying thank you for having us. Um, it's always a pleasure to talk about uh, Omar and kind of the journey we kind of went on to search for him. And we actually put together a little presentation, to kind of go through our process and kind of how we went about uh, creating this project. So I'll go ahead and share that now. And so the project started with um, us collaborating with Spoleto for an opera they commissioned with Rhiannon Giddens um, to kind of create a narrative opera about Omar's life and to, to, to show people kind of like who was this man. And so we kind of started working with them early and that was in the fall of 2019. And we kind of from there realized like we should try and find out who Omar was and search for him. And Omar had a very you know complicated journey in life. Um, he was captured in 1807 and brought to Charleston. And from Charleston, he was enslaved by, as he described, a cruel you know master. And from him, he escaped to Fayetteville, North Carolina, where he was again captured and you know, taken to a jail where his strange writings, as you know, people described it, uh, caught the attention of two brothers in Fayetteville, uh, James and John Owen, who were, you know, very politically at that time, you know, had a lot of power and he catches their attention um, for different reasons as we'll, you know, get into, but he ends up being bought by them and spends the rest of his life uh, basically with the family of the Owens um, spending most of his time in Fayetteville and Wilmington until he ultimately died um, at the Owens Plantation. 
So while Omar was uh, living in North Carolina, where he spent the vast majority of his enslavement, he wrote uh, a number of texts in Arabic. Um, more than a dozen of those texts survive, all written in Arabic. Most of them are short verses drawn from the Quran or the Bible. Um, he also wrote two letters that survive, but his most important piece was an autobiography that he wrote in 1831. It's short, just 15 pages, um, but it's, it's critical uh, in that it's the only known surviving autobiography written by someone who was enslaved in the US at the time in Arabic. And as best as I could tell, it was the only one written uh, that survives not in English at all. Um, the Library of Congress purchased the autobiography a few years ago, digitized it, put it up online. And so Omar uh, was suddenly much more out in the public. Um, but interestingly, Omar was not the only one writing about his life. Uh, many of the white people around him also wrote about him, often in um, fantastical ways, uh, making things up that really were not accurate to his life. They were essentially writing about him for their own purposes, namely uh, talking about his supposed conversion to Christianity, uh, which is a topic of considerable debate um, and uh, of interest to us. And so we set out to really try to answer the question of uh, who was the real Omar? And that was, uh, you know, a difficult process because a lot of the writings we had about Omar, as Jennifer was saying, was written by his owners and the people around him. You know, they described him as an Indian prince, you know, as this, you know, exotic person who was exiled from Senegal to, to, the, to the U.S. And so a lot of what we were trying to do is kind of ignore or get past all those writings to really find out who he was. And that kind of continually led us on our journey. When we, so when we started looking at Omar, one of the things was that um, he, he left a number of writings, but he really did not tell us a lot of very specific details overtly about his life. Uh, so where do you start? Um, we started in Charleston, where we are both based, uh, looking at the historical newspapers. There's a really good archive of the historical Charleston papers. Um, and we, we searched for things like the name Johnson. Uh, Omar mentions that the um, very wicked, cruel master that he ran away from was named Johnson. Uh, so we searched for Johnson and John Stun and variants of, of the name. He also later mentions a man named Mitchell coming to North Carolina, uh, either on behalf of Johnson or uh, as someone who had purchased him from Johnson. So we looked through all of these old newspapers looking for these names. Uh, we looked through the Slave Voyages database, trying to see if we could pinpoint what ship uh, brought Omar to Charleston narrowed it to probably about three likely ones at the end of 1807, uh, looked for uh, slave ship ads and auction ads to try to understand the context of the, the place and the time period uh, when he arrived in the city. Um, but the reality is that the historical record about Omar and Charleston is really very thin. Um, so we went then to North Carolina where he had spent much more of his life. And um, for those who haven't uh, read the, the story um, in the top, uh, left-hand corner, that's the church uh, Omar attended with the Owens First Presbyterian in Fayetteville, North Carolina, and where he was baptized uh, by the minister there. And below that is, you know, the, if you haven't been to Charleston, that's, that's Charleston, and you can see St. Michael's steeple, and um, basically the antebellum house is still, still there. And then the large photo is from is in Orofande, Senegal, which was uh, a town we visited um, with the people we were traveling with. And a lot of what we were doing was taking Omar's writings to various um, educators and leaders in Futatora, because, you know, Omar's writings, you know, were translated by people here who didn't really have an understanding of what he was writing um, and what dialect he was writing, which is something we, you know, had to process ourselves and figure out as we were traveling through the Futatora. One thing that we really felt strongly about was that Gavin and I wanted to go to Senegal to, to, um, to research Omar because um, we had, like I said, a limited historical record in Charleston. In North Carolina, we were able to find his, uh, the place where uh, the Owens were buried, and therefore it appears Omar was buried also, um, very overgrown and desolate. Um, it, 
But we wanted to go to Senegal because he had lived there for a third of his life. It obviously was critical in forming uh, who he was. Um, so we applied to the Pulitzer Center and received a grant to travel there. Um, and our first trip was planned for March, 2020, uh, which you might remember for a lot of reasons. Um, but we flew from Charleston to Atlanta in March, 2020 and landed in Atlanta and my phone started blowing up. It was my editor and my husband uh, texting me, have you been listening to what President Trump is saying? He was giving an address. And that was the night that, um, if you'll recall, he said that he was not gonna allow people to come um, into the US from Europe uh, after a few days from then. Uh, so all of a sudden we're presented with this possibility that we may not be able to get back to the US. Uh, we were getting ready to fly from Atlanta to Paris and then catch a flight to Dakar. Uh, so would we be able to come back? The president didn't mention at the time that US citizens would not be included in that, but we had to make a very um, quick decision and about 30 minutes before our flight left. Um, and we decided to cancel it that year uh, which gave us actually another year almost to regroup and really um, have a much more solid plan for going over there. Uh, so we were able to go to Senegal in February, uh, which was an amazing experience in a lot of ways. But um, we set out to really talk about Omar's um, life there. So what was the, the history of the region? What did the geography look like? Uh, how did the Islamic uh, faith of people look in practice? Uh, and we hired two uh, really critical people. Uh, one was a professor named Mamram Sek. Mamram is a, a professor in Dakar, a uh, professor of linguistics, and Abdullah Gia, who was a professor uh, at, his, at an Islamic institute in Dakar, uh, who taught Arabic and was um, able to read Omar's text for us. Um, we traveled around the capital, Dakar, then we went up the coast to San Luis, which is where um, uh, Omar most likely was taken out of. Uh, we wanted to see that city and, and see the place that most likely was the last um, place in Africa that Omar saw. Um, and then we went inland to Futatoro, which is a region along Northern Senegal that Omar said he was from. Uh, and one of the, there were a couple key things we wanted to do. We wanted to take his writing back to the people there. Um, not many people in that area had heard of him, even though he was becoming uh, somewhat well-known here in the U.S. Um, and we wanted to have someone from the region translate his writings because his Arabic was not something that people around him in the U.S. could read. And the translations of his work uh, up until then had been done by um, non-Senegalese translators. And we wanted to see uh, what a native uh, of the Futa read in his writings. And I can just say for me, one of the one of the most rewarding things was when we met with a, an historian in Podor, which is in Futa, uh, and he, he said that we had brought him a treasure by bringing Omar's work there. Because you have to remember for people in the area, historically, um, when people were captured and brought uh, to other places to be enslaved, it just left a great void. They didn't know what happened to them. They didn't know where they went. They didn't know what their lives were like. and so to have the, the text of this one man um, detailing his life, at least in the limited amount of details that Omar provides, um, was really great. And so we tried to bring his writing back there um, and really, uh, really focus in on what part of the Futa Omar was from. That's a very large region along Northern Senegal, um, uh, around the Senegal River. And Omar had written that he was from a place between two rivers. And so we wanted to find where that place was. And as we went around, we were able to really pinpoint um, that Omar most likely was from a place called the Isle of Morville, which is a, a, a very long island uh, formed by the Senegal River to the north and the Douai River to the south. Um, and then that in turn let us really focus in on villages there, asking people um, what they read in his writing where he wrote a word that appears to be a place name that can be translated in some different ways. It could look like the word Kaaba, most obviously, but Omar was writing in Ajami, taking another language and writing it in Arabic, um, probably Pular was the language that he spoke. And Arabic does not have letters for all of the sounds of Pular. And one of those is the sound of P. And so writers would often use the 
b sound in its place. So the word that looked like kaba could be read as something more like kapa or kape, which is ultimately the place where we felt he most likely was from. Um, we were able to go there and take his writings there um, and uh, provide a sense of what Kape's like and what Omar's life there might have been like. Um, and one, one other interesting thing I'll mention is that uh, almost everybody that we took Omar's writing to, we went to many imams and historians there, uh, all said that they felt Omar remained a Muslim his entire life and that the idea that Christianity is much different from Islam uh, maybe a way it's viewed in the U.S., but in, in Senegal, they saw it all as a, a connection of the same uh, story of, uh, along the line of the Abrahamic faiths. And so they had no problem seeing Omar as remaining Muslim, but, but being baptized uh, in the Christian faith, because that would have provided a way for him to worship and a way for him to be part of a faith community. It also would have been pleasing to his masters. Um, and so... Uh, I remember one of them, uh, one of the critical imams that we dealt with there, he said um, that he thought Omar was a true Muslim. He said, we don't have any doubt about that. Um, and I thought that was a really interesting way to, to look at it. And so Omar's life ultimately, you know, ended in Fayetteville, North Carolina. And this is um, the Owen Hill Plantation site um, where John Owen originally lived and across the river, the Cape Fear River, James Owen lived, but in Omar's later years, he lived with James Owen on this land. And the brick structure right there is where the Owens' uh, parents live and two of John Owen's children, but Omar was reportedly buried um, on the outside of this structure, uh, which unfortunately now has kind of become overgrown and you know, kind of used as just like a hangout site for people in the area and the grave was reportedly stolen um, after his death. So this is reportedly where um, he, you know, his final resting place. And this is a little kind of showing you kind of what we went through and where our reporting took us. As you can see, Charleston, Fayetteville, Dakar, San Luis, Puerto Orfande, Barobi, Dimont Wallow, and Cope Mangai. And those are some of the uh, professors Mamaram, um, Abdullah Gie, and Yusu Baji were uh, some of the researchers who traveled along with us to help us kind of go through, you know, immense amount of material. And this is us looking at maps in a museum in San Luis, trying to find Cope on a map, you know, to see if it fits the description Omar described. And as you, to, the, to the right of that is the sign for Cope Mangai which is where we spent an afternoon one day, you know, discussing with, you know, pretty much everyone um, there about if Omar could have been from there. Um, does this translation um, match how, you know, you spell Kope? And, you know, we would add, get into how they spell um, Kope Mengai and had a discussion about, you know, how Omar wrote it. And there's an ad for his death, as you can see, death of a venerable African and then who was Omar? That was kind of a big thing for us was really trying to get into the essence of who Omar was and something we tried to address through our project was what was his identity? You know, did he convert? You know, was he still um, Muslim? Uh, you know, did the writings people had about him match with who he actually was? And, you know, we could only go on so much. So that was a big part of, you know, us, you know, after these interviews discussing what we found and, you know, did we feel what was the pull in his life? You know, he's enslaved. And so he can't necessarily go against um, his owners at the time who were, you know, pushing him towards Christianity, but at the time still trying to hold on to his faith and, you know, essentially like his home and where he was from. And then just as Jennifer was saying, just taking Omar's writings back to Senegal was a big part about cutting, finding out more about his education. Cause you know, he, he describes, you know, studying for 25 years and what exactly did that mean? And we learned a lot about, you know, his writings as you can see to, to the right. 
You can see in the writing to the right, that's from a letter that he wrote. Uh, and one of the things we really wanted to hone in while we were there was the issue of where he wrote he was from. And within that um, line that's outlined in red, you can see um, to the far left where he wrote the word that some people read as Kaaba, uh, but there was no Kaaba that we could find in the Fujitoro region. Uh, and so uh, when we went around, it became more clear that it might have been something else. Omar didn't write, uh, as I mentioned earlier, that Arabic doesn't have a P sound. And then also uh, Omar wasn't great about writing the diacritics in Arabic, which uh, tell you the vowel sounds. So the word could be read a lot of different ways. So a lot of our journey was really going from village to village to village, trying to see what he wrote and did the imams and historians there think he wrote um, you know, this word or that word. And ultimately, Kape seemed to be the most likely. And, and actually, Mamram Sek and Abdullah Gia returned to Kape uh, just a couple months ago and are working on an academic uh, article about their travels following up on it. I'm personally really excited to read it. It looks like they were able to gather even more information that showed Omar was from this particular place, which then tells us things like, uh, what was his life like? What was his family like? and um, which river was he taken out of um, and that sort of thing. So um, it's a continuing story that is uh, unfolding there. And before I start uh, sharing, this is um, the Senegal River and this is in uh, Kope, Mangai. And these are our residents, you know, working on a boat along the Senegal River and across um, from the village is uh, Mauritania, which, you know, we learned a, a lot about during when speaking about trying to figure out what time period um, or year Omar was specifically taken, because he mentions a massive army and there's a few different, uh, you know, battles during that time that we think it might be. But you know, while we were there, everyone mentioned you know, of people coming from Mauritania constantly across the river and attacking villages, which seemed to be one of the indicators for why Kope Mangai might be the most likely uh, village where Omar's from. And then if you haven't, uh, I mean, seen our project, please go look at it. Um, there's no paywall, so you can go check it out and, and view it and, you know, see uh, kind of how all this reporting and everything came together and love to hear feedback from, you know, what anyone thinks, so. I'll hand it back over now. Thank you very much, Gavin. And thank you, Jennifer. Um, Gavin, you mentioned the prompt given uh, to the two of you by the commissioning of an opera, Omar, for Ryan and Giddens uh, to compose. Can you step back, either of you or both of you, from that a bit and explain, especially for the um, journalists and aspiring journalists in the audience, how, how the idea that this should become a piece of enterprise reporting that came to you and what the relative roles of the Post and Courier and the Pulitzer Center were in carrying the project forward. I remember, uh, so I remember the initial meeting, we sat down with representatives from Spoleto and discussed, you know, initially, initially just doing a project on the formation of this opera. Uh, Spoleto is a, a yearly um, event in Charleston it's a pretty big uh, time of the year uh, for us. And so it was initially, it was just to capture how does the opera come together? What goes behind it? You know, uh, how quick is it? And then as we were doing more research on exactly who Omar was, I think we started to talk amongst ourselves and be like, like we need to really dive deeper into Omar's story ourselves. And originally, we were going to take the story of the, the making of the opera and braid it with the story about Omar. Um, but a couple of things interfered with that. One was um, COVID delayed the opera. So the opera's premiere was delayed a year and then now another year. So it'll premiere uh, this May, coming May. So if anybody wants to come to Charleston and see its premiere, um, we're all really looking forward to that. Um, but it meant that the, the part of the story about the opera would have to wait. Uh, so we decided to really focus on Omar's story specifically. Uh, and the reason that it, it, we wanted to do something more with it was because, um, you know, Omar's story tells us a lot about many things. Uh, it talks about, for instance, 
you know, how many of the captives from West Africa were Muslims. That is not something that's widely known. It's certainly not widely known here in Charleston. Um, in uh, his life, it, it told us a lot about the bigger picture, but also um, we felt like since we hadn't really heard a lot about him, other people probably not either. And so it was an opportunity journalistically to really dive into an important story that our audience wouldn't be familiar with. So then this, what was the role of the Post and Courier and of the readers of Charleston and, and the Carolinas in the reception of the story? I think it was all, you know, really everyone, I think living in Charleston, everyone's kind of has their antennas up already for history here because there's so much of it around us. And then when you start telling someone about Omar's life and the details of his journey, I think people are just amazed, one, by what he went through and who he was. And then they just want to know more about like, oh, where is he from? Uh, you know, where did you find out who his mother was? Uh, you know, did they want to know more kind of about like, oh, who is his master in, in Charleston? All these, you know, fine finite details that we tried to find, but unfortunately didn't have as much luck, but people just want to know more about him. And so that's something that's been honestly good to, to, to receive from people is to, they just want to know more about Omar. I, don't, I heard a lot of positive feedback from his story. And again, I think uh, people were fascinated by his religious journey. Um, they wanted to know more specifically about him, which is very elusive. Um, and I think that they resonate with the idea of looking at this real person. We have these surviving images of him. You can see him. Um, you can, you know, read his own voice. And that's just something that we don't have enough of. And uh, to Gavin's point, I think people were really hungry to know even more. I, I, and I certainly was. I, I found him just to be a fascinating man, trying to understand what he went through and uh, what he was trying to communicate in his writings when he wasn't free to write what he wanted. He had to kind of couch things so that if someone translated his writings, he, um, you know, wasn't in trouble or worse. The significance of Omar ibn Said's life should go without saying in itself, every life being significant. And also in that so much of the history of enslavement involves the, um, uh, the obscuring and the disappearing of particular lives such that um, enslaved people uh, were, were forced to leave behind their identities when they arrived um, in the United States. And people say in Senegal would uh, wind up with no knowledge of what had happened to people who were um, enslaved and, and, and taken from that coast to, to our coast. So in that, in a, in a basic sense, the more you can particularize a particular life, um, the better. Then beyond that, and I'm asking because you two know better than I, what, why particularly is it significant that Omar Ibn Said was a Muslim? Well, I think that it's significant because, and these are just estimates, but there's estimates that, you know, one in five captives from Africa was Muslim. That's a tremendous population of people who are not uh, often widely remembered here. In the, in the Charleston area, for instance, we have two sea islands that had substantial, um, the substantial communities of enslaved people who did practice their Muslim faith openly and um, for a long time. But for many captives, they were coerced to uh, convert to Christianity or um, did so for whatever reasons, uh, so that we have a, a tremendous historical narrative about the Black Christian church, but we don't have as much understanding about the Muslim faith of so many people who came, or who were brought here and then came to Christianity um, later and so that their faith was lost. I think um, Gavin and I were one time talking about how if you are an African-American, the likelihood that your family includes ancestors who are Muslim is, is pretty good. Um, and to me, that's a story that just hasn't been told enough. And I think it, it goes against the narrative of enslaved people being this monolith, like they came from Africa and ended up here and there's no, there's no 
with Omar, you know, he's from Senegal and he had this whole history before he came here. And I think that's something people saw. He wasn't just this, this blank, you know, individual from Africa who was taken to Charleston and then soon was Omar. He was Omar before he arrived here. He had a life before he arrived here. And I, don't, I think that gets lost a lot of times when we talk about, you know, the enslaved people who were taken here. They came from Senegal, Gambia, you know, Nigeria, a lot of different countries in Africa, but it, it kind of gets limited down to just this, this African, you know, people that came over here. All the more so in his case, because he was already a younger adult, but fully adult when he arrived. I first knew of the story from the Library of Congress site. And one of the points that's made there is that, and I'm extrapolating a bit, um, the knowledge that Omar ibn Said was Muslim uh, counters a lot of assumptions that undergirded uh, the um, enterprise of slavery, uh, which was that um, African people were uh, polygamous and in the term of the time pagan and needed to be uh, Christianized. So the fact that they were part of the Abrahamic tradition, uh, a fifth of them, according to the statistics that Jennifer alluded to, um, runs strongly counter to that that narrative, which uh, was wound right into the center of uh, enslavement for so long. Is that right? Yes, very much so. And, and also counter to the narrative that they were um, sort of savages, you know, and in fact, Omar was far more educated uh, than most of the white North Carolinians around him. Uh, so there were a lot of things that ran counter to that narrative. And one of the points I thought was very interesting um, one of the experts we interviewed talked about was this idea that that so many of the enslaved people were identified as pagans or coming from pagan-like religions. When in fact, uh, you know, Islam really runs counter to that narrative. So why was that story not preserved more? And 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 this historian's thought was that perhaps it's because Islam, uh, as a fellow Abrahamic faith, is really much more like Christianity. And it becomes therefore a lot more difficult to, um, you know, put people into a certain box if they in fact are a lot more like you than you want to let on. And so her thinking was that perhaps the piece of, uh, that the storyline of the Muslim faith was intentionally not shared and, uh, and encouraged to be remembered because Islam is too much like Christianity and therefore they would seem too much like us, in other words. So it was to create an other storyline, the other as sort of this pagan, savage, different person from us that we can see as somehow lesser than. And so that Muslim storyline was intentionally um, rejected or neglected. The idea of Abrahamic faith, and there's probably um, a number of people in the audience who could um, clarify this point for me, but that is itself an idea that uh, postdates Omar Ibn Said's life in all likelihood. So he was a Muslim. Uh, he was described in the obituary notice that you showed on screen a little while ago as a devout Presbyterian. And there was a signal event in his life in North America that uh, had to do with him being presented a Bible in Arabic. What happened in that moment? Well, so Omar, um, Omar had retained his Muslim faith and was continuing to practice, you know, he observed Ramadan, he um, prayed, he covered his head, he did all, as many of the things as he could. Um, but the Owens, who were his masters, wanted him to convert to Christianity. They would read, read him the Bible, um, but they kind of figured one thing they really needed was to get him an Arabic language Bible so he could read it for himself and sort of see the beauty of the gospel and, and that sort of thing and convert. And they had reasons for that because they were part of the colonization, the American Colonization Society, which was um, attempting to use these, uh, these uh, enslaved people's stories for their own purposes. And they um, wanted to, to have Omar as sort of proof of the proof of, of what could be done with, uh, with an enslaved person. They would use his story uh, to further the colonization society's goals. Uh, 
and so they presented him with this Bible so that he could read it for himself. And then what happened? What what specifically does he say about his religious affiliation in his autobiography? Well, I think in his autobiography, I mean, he's still, it's funny because it goes back and forth between verses from the Quran and then the Lord's Prayer. And you kind of see like the, the economy that's happening within him, which is something he was continually battling with you know, while with the Owens, as Jennifer was saying, you know, the Lord's Prayer was a verse he would always write, um, which, you know, makes sense while he would kind of lean more towards that prayer um, when you read it. So I think in his autobiography, and maybe Jennifer can help me with this, like, he doesn't really land necessarily on kind of a, a point of I am Christian, I am you know, he kind of asked for forgiveness for forgetting a lot about his life, about his faith, and tries to hold on to that. Well, and the fact that he opens his um, writings, particularly here with the uh, with a surah from the Quran, is is fairly telling. I think the fact that he leans so heavily on Quranic passages um, conveys a lot about his mindset. You know, he goes on to. Um, talk about the Bible, but he also, you know, really lavishes all this praise on the Owens, which, um, you know, makes you wonder, was he, was he writing on some level, knowing that they could potentially get this translated, and then they would read what he wrote. So it kind of seems as if he's writing um, enough to be honest about his faith, but also enough to keep him out of trouble if they were to get it translated. Um, another really interesting text of his that I encourage anybody to go back and read who wants to know more about him is his is the letter that he wrote in 1819, and he writes it to um, John Owen. His he was his master was James Owen, and John Owen was his, the brother who eventually becomes governor of North Carolina. Um, and in this letter, he says he 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 couch he writes all of this religious verse. Uh, on one side of this one line and then all of this religious verse on the other side and sort of tucked between them is this line that says, I wish to return to the land of Africa to a place called, and in in that word that we were talking about earlier, Kabe, Kaba, uh, whatever the specific place is. So it's as if he hid it in there um, so that if the letter was translated again, it, it would look mostly just like, well, a lot of religious text. And that seems to be what he was doing all along was he, was was couching ideas uh, within um, a, a, a lot of religious verse. Uh, and that's the way his autobiography strikes me. And when we took it over to Senegal, uh, what a lot of the Imams saw was that this was somebody who was a Muslim at heart. He, he begins with Surah Al-Mulk, which is um, you know, a, a, key, a key passage of the Quran. Uh, well, if he was a converted Christian, why didn't he start it off with, you know, Genesis? Or why didn't he start off with the Lord's Prayer or the 23rd Psalm? Uh, these were things that he knew how to write and he had written. Um, but instead, he starts it with a passage from the Quran. And that's, uh, I think, pretty telling. So the suggestion you made a bit earlier is that uh, he couched his autobiography and he, he wrote it cautiously out of the consideration that it might be translated. The uh, Library of Congress scholars make a very different assertion. They assert that part of the significance of the document derives from the fact that because it was written in Arabic, he was probably more honest and candid than he might have been if he'd been writing in English under the shaping hand of his masters. I guess my question, let me come to the point of it, with all due respect for um, his uh, lifelong um, connection with Islam, uh, framed in so many ways and set out um, so distinctly by you two in your presentation. There's a suggestion in your stories that his relationship to Christianity was rooted in bad faith, that it had to do with his wish to please his masters, to gain a home, to gain a certain amount of comfort. What specifically is the basis for those assertions on your part, that his Christianity was somehow uh, uh, lacked the integrity that his Muslim faith has and had? I don't think it's that his faith that I don't think it's that his Christian faith was that it was rooted in bad faith or it derived from that. I think the the point we were trying to make was more that he 
that he didn't necessarily have to give up his Muslim faith in order to practice as a Christian, because he could go to church and be part of a Christian faith community and still be very um, faithful to his roots in, in Islam. It, it was more that I don't think one has to preclude the other. He, um, he wasn't writing only about the Bible. He didn't write his autobiography all about the, like I said, the Lord's Prayer or whatnot. Why, if he was, uh, was he, if he was a Christian, why did he include all of those passages of the Quran? Why did he make it vague? And to the earlier point, he, um, he did know that his writings could be translated. They had a visitor um, at his plantation who came, who clearly spoke and read Arabic. Um, there's indications that some of his writings were translated. One of the questions is, was that 1819 letter I referenced earlier translated into English? Because after he wrote that, he stuck for many years to only writing, as far as we can tell, based on what survives, only writing um, short quotations, essentially, of Quranic or biblical verses. He doesn't go into anything else about wanting to go to Africa or uh, anything about himself until he's asked to write his autobiography many years later. So uh, why is that? You know, raises a question of, uh, did, did they get the letter translated? Did the Owens find out that he had written that? You know, we don't know. Um, but I think one of the key indicators, which is sort of simple, is that he did not write uh, only biblical passages. Um, his very last writing that survives, as far as I'm aware, which is couched as a biblical passage, in fact, is, is a verse from the Quran. So why is that if he had converted? It's a good question. I guess what I'm uh, detecting though is this a wish to uh, pit Christianity and Islam against each other in the life of this man, when based on the account that you give and those that I've read on the Library of Congress site and elsewhere, there's a suggestion that there was a natural, um, what might be called a syncretic approach that he was taking in which elements of Christianity and Islam uh, uh, were retained by him and he worked out a rough and ready a harmony between them in his own life. Uh, do you think that's a fair characterization? I think so. I think, you know, early on in his autobiography, he's very critical of, you know, he calls of Charleston, this Christian city and the Christian language and Christian men who took him here. So he's very critical of Christianity and you know, his cruel master who owned him before he escaped, he very much kind of bases a little bit of his view, I believe, on Christianity through that initial, you know, time in Charleston, which is you now kind of why we think like it might have one who was, you know, owned by the Owens and, you know, they're treating him a lot different than his master in Charleston, and, you know, and giving him clothes and food and not having him to do hard labor, I think he, he kind of realizes, I think it's something we were discussing while, you know, working on this project, possibly realizes, you know, he won't be able to, you know, return home or, you know, escape, you know, the Carolinas possibly, and kind of works for himself a way to practice his faith, as you were saying, in this synchronistic way. And I, I'll add, I don't think that he, well, I don't think that that Omar uh, saw Islam and Christianity, particularly um, later in his life as being in conflict. And that was the point I was trying to make earlier, particularly with the Imams in Senegal, um, that I think in the US, we have at times talked about his story more in terms of, you know, he was either Christian or Muslim, but in Senegal, there was much more of a view that we found that, that those things um, could be, um, um, more harmonious, that he could have had a faith that involved both. Um, and that that seemed to be the predominant view that we found there from people who read his writings. And it seems to make a lot of sense because he included both again in his autobiography, uh, when he would write for other people, he sometimes wrote um, from the Bible, sometimes from the Quran. Um, so I do think that there's more of a story uh, more to his story about how he was able to um, to, to worship through both uh, lenses, essentially. Thank you. And it's striking uh, what Gavin 
the point Gavin made a couple of moments ago that uh, Omar Ibn Said was um, sufficiently well versed in Christianity to see, and evidently, according to what, what you just said, Gavin, um, uh, highlight the hypocrisy of the white Christians of Charleston. <laughs> that they were not acting as Christians, they were owning people, they were beating people, they were treating them cruelly and in human, in human ways. Uh, is, is that what you were getting at? Yeah, and I mean, you can see it as he, he kind of refers to like his verses that he uses in terms of like who has power, you know, over, over people and, you know, how judgment will be, you know, reserved for them. So I think he's very aware of this, this relationship that he first experiences in Charleston between the white Christian um, slaveholders and you know the enslaved community. I'm going to turn now to questions from the audience, and the first one, uh, a very good question in light of all the work that you've done. Um, do you think there are unwritten and untold stories about Omar Ibn Said? And if any, what is the implication of unwritten and untold stories of enslaved peoples such as him? So you've got some stories now. You you and others have done a tremendous act of historical recovery, but that only may, that suggests there may be lots more to the story. Yeah, there's plenty. Um, we still don't know. Um, we still don't know who exactly his owner was in Charleston. We still are trying to figure out how exactly he got to North Carolina. Um, you know, if he you know went from Charleston. To the Carolinas, he has to cross three major rivers, um, swamps. You know, it wasn't like today where there's paved roads. And this is someone who said, I couldn't do hard labor. So that's something we're still trying to figure out in terms of his journey up there and just what exactly, you know, his life was with the Owens. That's still something, you know, we have an idea, but it's still very complicated about his relationship with them. You know, he was seen as, as I described it, Uncle Morrow, you know, part of the family. But at the same time, he still he wasn't able to sit with them when they went to church. You know, there's still he was on the church service records. He was listed as a servant. So there's still this relationship that he had with, you know, the people around him in this community that we're still trying to figure out. And, you know, a lot of it, unfortunately, is just lost to the time the the Owen Hill Plantation um, burned down um, at the end of the 1800s. And so a lot of the things that we could have looked to for information is, is most likely gone now. Although I'd add, you know, his, his, his manuscript was lost for so many years until it was rediscovered in a trunk that you have to then think, gosh, what else could be out there? And there are scholars out there looking at Omar who uh, have found or, or, or believe that they found additional uh, of the short passages he wrote. I think it would be fascinating to know uh, or to imagine what else might be out there. You know, did he write something that was, you know, that would shed some more light on him? We, we just, we don't know, but um, it, it seems like he wrote enough that surely there's hope that there's more out there. He died in 1864 and for three decades before that, and I don't want to oversimplify, but he was treated with a certain amount of respect by the Owens and in the Presbyterian Church, who recognized his learning, uh, his sophistication, his singularity. Were any of the people who did that recognizing abolitionists and did his life converge at all with the abolitionist movement? Well, his life converged with the abolitionists in, in, in as much as it converged with the American Colonization Society, which was a group of people who uh, came at this view from a variety of of ways that, that freed blacks should be shipped back to Africa, to Liberia. Um, now, how they came to that view is different. You had some who were straight up abolitionists. You had some who like the Owens were slave owners, but saw free blacks as something that could be a threat to them. Uh, it was a pretty broad group, um, but, but his life story converged with the abolitionists who were part of that movement. Um, but the Owens were, I've not found any evidence that the Owens were part of the colonization society because they themselves were abolitionists and, and, um, and there's nothing to indicate that. 
Uh, we couldn't find any evidence, for instance, that James Owen or John Owen, when he died, for instance, would have freed any enslaved people that they owned. Um, but Omar would have been at least um, uh, from some distance involved with abolitionists, involved in the colonization society. But we never ran across any evidence that showed he, you know, had met anybody like that or was in um, in kind of relationship with anyone like that. Most of the people that we saw he met with through the Owens were people of like minds, particularly ministers. They were very active in the Presbyterian Church in particular, and a lot of ministers came through their a home in Wilmington and also their plantations and uh, outside of Fayetteville. So we couldn't find any evidence that Omar had direct contact with abolitionists, but as I said, sort of one step removed through the colonization society that his owners were very involved with, his story could have been circulating among them. Another question from the audience. Um, in, in the autobiography, say, did Omar Ibn Said make reference to the uh, conditions of his uh, capture and, and sale. Specifically, uh, were Muslims involved in the sale of him that uh, led him to be uh, put on a ship and sent to North America? Well, I think that was something um, we learned at the time that was in Senegal, a big draw as Islam be going through the northern region of Senegal was was bringing a lot of people towards the faith was uh, you couldn't enslave another Muslim. And so it's unlikely that um, they were involved. Um, but at the time, um, you know, you have the French um, colonizing, you know, Senegal, and you also have, you know, try, uh, you know, villages and other people from Mauritania, you know, crossing the Senegalese river and attacking other villages and then trading and then trading them um, to you know slave traders as in Saint Louis. And to answer the question about what Omar wrote in his autobiography about his capture, he did write that a large army came to his place, as he puts it, um, and killed many people and captured him, and then took him to um, a, you know, a big ship in the big sea, uh, sort of idea. Um, so he doesn't tell us a whole lot. Um, one thing I think is interesting is that he later writes prayers about his mother in which he refers to, um, you know, or, or basically her to her tomb and makes you think, well, was she killed in that battle? Um, his father had apparently died when he was very young. Um, so his mother would have survived um, possibly when till he was captured and was she killed in that raid? Um, we don't know, but it was interesting that he, he references her in that way. And, and she's the only one I could find um, out of his family that he mentions. For instance, he doesn't mention a wife or children back home. And he was captured at 37, um, which particularly in that day would have been uh, not a young person. Um, so we know that there was some sort of a large attack on his village. Um, the people in Cape described, the, as Gavin was mentioning frequently, Moors from Mauritania would cross over the Senegal River and raid villages for captives, um, which uh, sounds a lot like what he wrote. And he did call the people who captured him infidels, um, but that could mean somebody who's not a Muslim or somebody who's a Muslim, but is acting outside of, uh, of you know, proper tenets of the faith. So it, it doesn't appear that there were any Muslims involved um, or uh, at least he called them infidels. Very specific question about the, identification of his hometown, uh, would it be possible to transliterate it as something like Kafba Alif? I don't believe the F sound coming up at all when we were there. Uh, the, the, the translations that we got, the most obvious translation of the word is Kaba. Uh, some people saw Kabia. K-A-B-A, right? It's... Correct, correct. And, um, there was no Kaaba in the Futa that we could find on any of the ancient maps, new maps, any maps. We couldn't find anything. Nobody in the Futa knew of a place called Kaaba, um, which isn't to say it didn't exist. Uh, and that's why we started moving forward into other um, uh, other ways you could read the word. But no, I never heard of an F sound coming up in it. Now, I don't read Arabic, so I'm going by what 
you know, what our what our translators came up with or what imams read it as there. Now, I suppose to my own question before uh, we reach the top of the hour, I was struck uh, going through the project uh, and hearing you talk about it on the podcast, how in this instance, a typical order of things has been inverted. You know, typically, uh, enterprise journalism then serves as the basis for imaginative work. In this case, the imaginative work, the Opera Omar Commission for Ryan and Giddens led to your story and also in this historical moment, an extraordinary act of imagination about the uh, time of enslavement in Charleston, the Underground Railroad by Colson Whitehead was, won the Pulitzer Prize and found a uh, very large readership. So I suppose my question, first of all, is whether you were in touch with either of those artists as they carry forward these stories imaginatively. And then related to that, what it would mean for you as a journalist to see others fill in the blanks imaginatively in Omar Ibn Said's life as is likely to happen. So we did, uh, we actually, we went to a few rehearsals for Omar and spoke with uh, Rhiannon uh, a few times, um, I think in 2000, a few times in 2019 and a couple times in 2020. And then um, this year they had, um, uh, they did a workshop over here and we were able to uh, talk again with Rhiannon about kind of her process and how she's uh, telling Omar's story which is, you know, a little different um, from, you know, how we're obviously doing it and how she's incorporating music and, you know, music from that time. Like, for example, um, she plays the banjo. And so she's incorporating uh, music from that, the North Carolina region that she knows that would have matched Omar's time. So she's kind of reaching back and pulling that to tell this very American story you know, through an, an opera, which um, I don't know much about opera. And so so this is something I think is like pretty new and pretty inventive. Um, we didn't talk to Colson Whitehead, I don't think about, about it or about um, his journey. And what an interesting thing with Rhiannon is that she has a fictional character in there that kind of helps guide some of the narrative about Omar that we uh, don't know because he, he just didn't leave enough information uh, that we know of. Um, but one of the most interesting things I thought talking to her along, because we talked with her along the way that we did the story, because as I said, we were going to marry these stories originally. Now we'll run the opera story in May when the, re when the opera does premiere. Um, but talking to her about how to end it, uh, that that was one of the things that she really kind of wrangled with was how do you end a story uh, with a message to a reader where we don't know so much. You know, we don't know, for instance, that we had the whole conversation about Christianity and Islam. Um, how, how do you devise a satisfying ending uh, for an audience when there's so much that is up for interpretation? Um, and I don't want to give away her ending because I think we should all go see the opera, but uh, it was really interesting to listen to her process uh, going through that as well, because we obviously um, wrestled with the same thing. I think Rhiannon Giddens is a brilliant artist and I can't wait to see the opera. I hope to see you at the Spoleto Festival in May. <laughs> Meanwhile, Jennifer, thank you. Gavin, thank you. Thank you to Michael Kessler. Thank you to the Pulitzer Center. And thank you to all who have uh, tuned in for this presentation. I've learned so much about Omar Ibn Said just in this hour. And I'm so grateful to both of you for going into this story, which as you suggest, doesn't have an obvious ending. So just will keep opening to us probably for decades to come. Well, thank you. Thank you thank very you. much.